So, uh, nice to have you all here. And what we're going to talk about today is AST, Application Security Testing. And I'm going to relate a little bit to, what, to some of the things that Zane said uh, in this talk. So, it's uh, nice and complimentary. So, uh, if you don't know me, a few words about myself. Um, I've been doing security for over 20 years, most of it in application security. I've been in almost every side of this space. I was a pen tester, I had a pen testing company, I was a consultant, I worked for a product company for a while, for a testing company. There's pretty much nothing I haven't done yet in software security. Um, and so I've seen a lot. Um, I learned to ignore a lot of the fluff and the bullshit and um, now I'm part of Synopsys. So Synopsys acquired my last company, and Synopsys uh, is building a complete set of testing tools I'll talk about in a second. And what I'm trying to do today in Synopsys is help to take all these things we bought and make it into a coherent portfolio, uh, which is a very interesting task, because uh, as you'll see through this talk, it's a very complicated space. Um, I've been a hacker for a lot of years, a good hacker. And I've been with OWASP since its inception, so it's been a really long, fun ride to see how the application security space has evolved. Uh, my last company uh, did an IaaS solution. I was one of the pioneers of the space. Um, I'm also an avid photographer. Unfortunately, that doesn't pay well, so I don't get to do that on a professional level. Uh, and so I started plugging my photos into my talks. Anybody who's been to my talk in the last two years knows that. But this talk, I'm going to do something new, which is all the photos in this talk are going to be mine, even if they're only loosely related to the topic. So we'll see how that goes. Um, another thing that I'm started to do, because this is my third DevSecCon, is I always put on the front now a picture from the last DevSecCon. So this I took in the last one I spoke at in Boston. Uh, this is Boston. If you've never been there, a great city. Uh, don't come in the winter. Um, <laughs> so a few words about Synopsys, and that will be my only commercial plug for this talk. Uh, so Synopsys uh, is today a leader in the space of application security testing. Basically, Synopsys came from hardware testing and started this new space four years ago. We acquired about 10 companies over the last four years, and we now have pretty much everything in the space. So dynamic testing and static testing and open source testing and professional services and managed services, and a lot of good stuff, which I don't want to waste this talk about. If you want to hear more about it, you can talk to me after, or go to our booth, and have uh, fun learning about us. So, what are we going to do today? Um, we're going to do a quick, well, we did a quick intro. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the CICD challenge, and I'm going to go really quickly through that, because I think that's all you guys have been hearing for the last uh, day and a half. Um, and we're going to talk about the AST landscape. We're going to talk about the different technologies for application security testing, what they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and how they fit or don't fit uh, CICD. And then, after we understand all those details, we're going to build the right mix. We're going to see how we can make all this work for CICD. And there are, of course, more than one way. So what I'm going to tell you is, is my suggestion, of course but it should help you get a little bit direction. <coughs> so the CICD challenge. The CICD challenge is, well, that. It's the only photo that's not mine in this, in this talk. I just couldn't get something that good. Uh, so it's fast, right? We know that it's fast. And I want to talk just one second about buzzwords. So CICD is part of our buzzword, DevOps. DevSecOps, Agile, and it's a lot of words and techniques and things that all evolve around the notion of let's deliver software faster, right? So five years ago, everybody talked Agile. Today, Agile is sort of a bad word, even though all we do in CICD is, of course, being Agile. So the whole idea is to get software out faster and to do it in a very repetitive and continuous process, right? We don't do the waterfall thing anymore. We get everything um, done in a cycle. And I bet you can find 100 different graphs that talk about this. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because you know this stuff. 
I do want to get a few minutes to talk about continuous delivery. Because what I see is when I go to customers, everybody says CI, CD, but 99% do CI, not CD. Right? Everybody wants to do CD. Etsy did CD, but I know maybe 1 or 2% of the customers I talk with actually do CD. The ones that do do CD are accelerating it insanely. I've seen customers with over 1,000 pushes a day. Every little thing gets pushed. It's like, oh, I wrote this little piece of code. Do, 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 done out. It's amazing. And this is when we build our plan for how to do security testing, we need to think about that. Don't try to build a complete new framework for your CI testing that is right for today. Try to build it so it will be right in five years or in three years when this is what you'll do. So I took this uh, graph from uh, Wikipedia. I don't know if it's the best diagram, but essentially what we see here is that we keep getting this feedback loop, right, where we start pushing, do a little testing. If it fails, it goes back, go a little deeper, and so on. But all this can happen in, say, five minutes, right, to get it all out. So we have to adjust to that. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is that in this world, there's no longer a single CI integration of all our software building into one place. There are multiple streams of continuous integration, multiple streams of continuous delivery, and testing is becoming completely different. You know, you go to these CD shops and you talk to them about test environment and they laugh because they don't know this anymore. They all move to A-B testing, right? So if you don't know A-B testing, not in the context of user functionality, but in the context of CICD, right? A-B testing, is all about we have, let's say, 100 production servers, right? And now we have a new uh, issue deployed, so or a new functionality. So we deploy it just to one server. And we have a closed set of people that can go there. Uh, I think Wix gave a really good talk about that, how they do that. And essentially, first few minutes or hours, only Wix employees get access to this. Then they push it to a few more servers. It get it out to 1% of their customers, which are beta test customers. It's a restricted group. And then 5%, 10%, 25%, and so on. And this lets you get over that phase of doing a uh, dedicated test environment, which may or may not be the right environment compared to your production. And it lets things flow much faster. And the problem is when you talk to a lot of people that do security testing, this is baffling to them, right? Because A-B testing, that means it's on production already before we did testing. How can we live with that? So we'll get to that later. But you have to understand that even if you don't do it today, you will do it in two years. Because A-B testing is the future of CICD. Nobody wants to maintain a separate testing environment. And there's going to be parallel testing and deployments, right? So I could have this feature now being propagated to 5% of the server, while already the next version of this feature is on the 1% behind it. Right? It could be that fast. <coughs> now, another thing we need to talk about is risk. So if you've never heard the term risk appetite, um, it's a term that auditors like, you know, the big four and the one. But it's essentially how much risk an organization is happy to take. There are organizations that are naturally uh, risk happy, right? Startups is a good example. If they don't take risk, they die. Um, if they take risk, they may die, but they may succeed. And there are organizations that are very averse to risk, like big financial organizations. Um, but you have to understand your risk appetite. And then you have to understand the risk. So when you live in a fast push of features, you're going to have risk. Now, don't take me wrong. If you live in a slow push, you're also going to have risk. You just have this notion where you did a pen test, and now there was no feature update for three months that you don't have a risk. You have a huge risk. You also have a huge risk that is not a security risk by pushing software slow, right? So 
we, we are security people. We care only about security. But as a company, you do CICD because you care about your business, right? You want to move faster as a business. So not doing CICD is a huge business risk. Pushing features without testing them thoroughly is somewhat of a security risk. You have to learn to live with that, right? And you have to accept it. It's a maturity process that every security person has to go through. You have to live with risk. But you need to understand risk, right? And I think Zane talked really well about that. You need to understand what is the potential risk of a specific vulnerability, right? And I always try to simplify it into two um, categories, right? Is this a real exploitable vulnerability? Or is it you know, bad coding practice on the other hand, or somewhere in between? You have to understand how likely it is for someone to exploit it, right? Maybe it's a SQL injection, but there's a character limit length that makes it practically impossible to exploit. Okay, we can live with that. Um, the other side is where is it? Is it on the public front end? Can anybody access it? Or, you know, it's somewhere on the administrative interface where only five people that I trust can exploit it. And you have to understand that and learn how to use it. And we'll get to that when we talk about how we mix it all together. So learn to live with risk. So before I go into uh, the specific application security testing technologies, I want to talk about the five criteria that I always look at when we talk with customers about application security testing in the context of CICD, right? It's speed, how fast is it? I think that's kind of self-explanatory. If it's not fast, we have a problem. It's integration, meaning how well does it build into my CICD pipeline? Because if it doesn't, I'm out. Um, ease of use. Developers do not want to learn to use complicated security tools. They want something that works as part of their workflow in their IDE or whatever pipeline they're using. Relevance. Ac people call it accuracy, but I call it relevance. How relevant are the findings? Is it something that they really need to take care of? Or is it a 13,000 pages report that has 90% false positives and another 9% of things that are true but not really interesting, right? And then finally, actionability. Once we find something, can we really understand how to fix it really, really quickly? We don't have time to waste on now spending hours in learning and understanding, right? So let's talk about the AST landscape. What works and what doesn't? Um, so one thing before I go into that, I want to talk about this, software security as a journey. Um, a lot of years we try to say, well, here are the best practices for software security, right? Uh, you should do all of them and you'll be fine, right? Uh, realistically, it doesn't work this way, right? When, when I went, when I had my pen testing company, right? You go to a customer, they've never done AppSec. They don't know what they need to do. So they would usually just start, they'll, they'll buy a pen test. Right? Uh, you get them the pen test with the big SQL injections and the movies of how you exploit them, and they get all nervous, and they say, oh, okay, so I need something more. And then they start to mature, right? And as they start to mature, they start building a program for application security, they start integrating into their development, and as they mature even more, they get everything automated as part of their pipeline and so on. So, Depending on your organization, try to understand you're not going to be able to bring people all the way to the top in one day. It's a process, and there's a maturity process. It's a maturity process on the security side. It's a maturity process on the development side. So you really have to understand that this is a journey. And I'm sure by the time you get to the nice optimizing bullets there, the space will evolve again, and you'll need to do more things. Right? So it's an ongoing work. And what I try to explain to my customers always is the people on your application security team, they need to drive this. They need to drive the journey, not the testing. If they spend, if you have six people doing pen tests all the day, then you're not optimizing your resources because they should drive this maturity. They should drive driving the security into the development process. Okay, so let's go 
to the technical side. So the AST landscape, and I call it um, asterisk AST, because now everything is SAS, DAS, YAS, MAST, and a bunch of other acronyms, all dubbed by Gartner, by the way. Um, and some of them are better describing what it is, and some are worse. But we'll go through all of them. Um, so you see there's a lot of things in this space. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we're fo going to focus on the first five. Um, and you know, when you look at the legacy way of using things, you could fit all of these different technologies and other things like architecture review and training into this nice waterfall um, phase. But it's really all getting very confusing, right? So let's try to figure out what it all means. So just to put it out there, the criteria again, and I'm going to go through each of these, talk about what it does, and how does it fit the criteria. So static analysis, I assume everybody here knows what static analysis is. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, static analysis takes in code and analyzes how it's supposed to run. What does it mean, how it's supposed to run? Ideally, static code analysis can do data flow, meaning it can see how your data goes through your code, or what are the potential data paths through your code. And code flow, which is what is the potential code execution flow in your code, right? And these are things that look like these nice graphs. <coughs> AST, oh, sorry, SAST, static analysis, um, is probably right now the most prominent application security testing technology in the market in terms of revenue, OK? Um, it's been around for a long time. I think Fortify was probably the first static analysis for security, and that's early 2000s. Um, there are a lot of players in the space. Uh, it's matured a lot. It's improving a lot. The early SaaS technology was really bad in terms of false positives. But we still have a lot of challenges with that. Um, there are still relatively lots of false positives in static analysis. Um, what makes static anal analyzers better over time is our ability to tune them better, um, filter better, help them become more relevant, but they still generate false positives. Another thing they generate is bad coding practices. So let's say I found something which is real. It's a true positive. It's not a false positive. But it's something that may not really get exploited. Right? Is it false positive? No. It's a problem in your code. Should you fix it? Ideally, yes. Is it a real risk? Hard to determine. And this is one of the biggest challenges of um, static analysis. Now, it's offered today in various flavors. And I'll, go, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So you can do it in binary and, and build and so on. So in terms of speed, right? speed of static analysis has always been its Achilles heel, but it's changing a lot these days. So the traditional static analyzers could take hours to run. And ours, as we all know, is bad, right? We need five seconds at most to run something in a CACD pipeline. Um, in terms of integration, it really depends on the vendor that you use. Some built it for security people, and their integration is not so great. Some built it to, for developers, and their integration is much better. Um, ease of use depends. I would say most of the traditional static analyzers tend to be complex. Some of the newcomers are easier to use. Um, relevance, what I talked about. It can be very overwhelming, right? 13,000 pages is generally overwhelming to most developers. I remember back in my consulting company days, we were hired by one of the largest customers in Israel to, um, to help them get a static analyzer in. I won't mention the vendor. We got in. We got, it wasn't as bad. It was just, I think, 700 pages. Um, but the developer, came, the developer team came back and said, well, we can fix everything in this report, but we don't do new features for the next year. Um, and then they threw it out, and we never did it anymore, which is why I started my other company. But we'll get to there in a minute. Um, so in terms of actionability, though, static analyzers are the best. right? They give you the exact line of code, where to fix it, how to fix it, again, depending on the quality of the vendor, of course. But they're generally spot on. Now, 
I want to talk a little bit about SAS flavors because we see an, a big shift in the space now because of the challenges that the traditional static analyzers are doing. We, we do the same. We're shifting the same way. So the traditional ones, right, if you look, were the build ones, right? You take a static analyzer, it integrates into the build. It uses the build artifacts to better understand the data flow and code flow because it's easier to do so when you use uh, the build from a technology perspective. And then it, uh, you get the results. The problem with it is that if you integrate to the build, you're already not left enough in the process, right? I need to have a working code that builds. I want to find things earlier. The other problem is that they can take hours to run and they can be overwhelming. So what we see is we see shift um, you know, upwards in things that are faster. So some offer incremental testing that happen in the ID. They still leverage on the full build analysis, but they can now only test the increment of code change. This turns it from hours to minutes or seconds. Um, and we see this new trend, which is the ID spell checker, right? Meaning as you code, you get uh, things identified before the build and it just comes up on your ID. Like you type in Word and you get a bad spelling, you type your code and you get a security vulnerability. These are really, really great. They're lightweight, they're fast, and they're as left as you can think about. Um, we also see things that are binary analysis. These analyzed binaries, they're very popular for audits and supply chain challenges uh, because you don't need the source code. Right? They are favored with security people. I can take all the binaries. I don't need any cooperation from my developer. I'll just upload it and get results. And they have their use like anything else in this space. Yeah, what, one thing you'll see as I go through this talk is there is not a single technology I think is wrong. They all have their place, right? And then um, managed services, which is really great for those that are still evolving and don't know how to do this on their own. Um, we, we, we sell tons of that because you know, they're short staffed everywhere. So that was SAST. DAST, dynamic application security testing. So DAST was probably the first technology in the market, right? I think late 90s, I remember they were still, AppScan were the first, they were still called Perfecto in their first day. I was still in my military service when I saw their presentation in 99 and my mind was blown. HTTP hacking, hidden field manipulation. Wow, it's just been 20 years. Um, but it's a challenging technology. It's a challenging technology because it's slow. DAS generally ch tends to run hours, sometimes days. I've had customers come to me, well, we don't care about accuracy. We just need it to not run three days every time because that really slows our CI pipeline. Um, and the results are not too accurate, and worse, they're not too relevant. And one of the things we've discovered, DAST is only a tool for security people. You're, very rarely, you'll see developers actually use it. And because of that, DAST has been very successful as a managed service, again, because you get it um, done. So when you look at it for, for CI, CD, I would generally say this is good mostly, at the end for another verification layer, or like Zane suggested, just for very specific things. Because a full DAS test takes hours to days, it doesn't integrate into your CI CD pipeline very well. And the worst part, the worst part is that you don't know where to fix it in the code. Oh, there's you know there's a cross-site scripting somewhere behind these, you know, five thousand lines of code. Now spend the next two days finding them. Um, I remember, I can't remember who wrote it, but somebody wrote a blog about it maybe 10 years ago calling them a badness monitor, right? They tell you how bad your application is, but that's about it. Um, so, difficult. So that brings me to IAST, and I'm obviously uh, biased toward IAST because it's what I did for the last uh, almost 10 years. But... <coughs> IAST tries to take dynamic analysis in a different way. And the way IAST works, if you've never heard about it, 
IS does runtime code analysis using instrumentation for the most part. Uh, some technologies that don't support instrumentation use different techniques. And the idea is that you put an agent on your server, a very lightweight a agent that is in the test environment, and I mentioned that could be in the 5% of uh, the servers that you use for your A-B testing. Um, and it will look at the code as it's being executed. And it has flavors too, and I'll talk about it as well. But ideally, it can see exactly how the code is being executed. So it doesn't have to assess the data flow and code flow like a SAS tool needs to do. It just sees the code flow and the data that flows through the code. So it knows exactly what has been accessed through the front end and is relevant. Um, and it can also look at code that is generated on the fly, like struts. And it really helps uh, to run. And if you've read some papers written about this in the last couple of years, there's a general notion that IST is very useful for CI-CD because it lets you test running code very, very quickly. So speed. Speed, and it depends on the flavor, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's instant in the sense that you just throw it there, and as people use it, you're testing your test automation, whatever uses the application, you get feedback. Or hours, if you want to simulate a full DAST plus uh, IAS scan. Um, it's very integrated, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's the core of the IS technology, but all the vendors that build IS build it for CICD, and so they all spend a lot of energy on, on getting it um, into the test automation. It's really, really easy. That's one of the big parts. And it's very relevant. So IS helps you focus on the vulnerabilities that come from the front, that come from the exploitable parts, and that can really, really uh, have an impact. And it's very actionable. So it, instrumentation looks at bytecode or CLR code. So it won't give you the exact line code number like a static analyzer. But it will give you uh, something that's very, very close to that. And it's good enough for a decent developer. So I want to talk a little bit about IS flavors. So there's been, you know, it's, a, it's still a new technology. So there's still a lot of vendors trying to figure out how to do it the best. And uh, what we've learned is that, like anything else, there isn't one good answer. So we're now building all these different modes. But basically, there is one approach that says, I'm just going to throw an agent. And because I do runtime analysis, I need to look at running code. I need the application to be driven. And I won't do that. I'll let somebody else do it. This is great for mature CICD shops, because they have test automation with good coverage. And I just throw my agent there, and I see what they do. And great. And I can find results. Um, the challenge is it doesn't always have good coverage. And you need, I, I was just in a meeting the other day when the customer said, well, you know, I, I don't have test automation yet. We, well, I, I was in 10 meetings like that, not one. Um, and, and it's normal, right? Because we're all trying to get to that point. Um, so the active version has a component that's a little bit DAST-like and can drive the application to drive this and can also create exploits and do fuzzing and malicious attacks. But it's much faster than DAST. And why is it? Because DAST, because it's black box, right? It doesn't know anything about the application. So it has to um, go through every parameter with all the vulnerabilities and all their flavor. With IS, you just send a single request and you can do most of the analysis on the server side. So moving on to the next buzzword, SCA or OSS. This is very confusing because SCA used to be static code analysis. And now it's software composition analysis um, or supply chain analysis, which is another use of these uh, um, letters. Anyway, open source library scanning, right? This is becoming, this is probably the fastest growing space. Uh, we just acquired another company in this space because it's growing so fast. And basically, open source scanning says you're using a lot of third-party libraries in your code because you want to write code really, really fast. Uh, so you write 10 lines of code to integrate 5,000 lines of code. And then 
we have no control on how our developers take these, vulner uh, take these libraries, how they use them, do they update them. If there's a new bug, like Heartbleed, do they update their SSL package? Who knows? So SCA knows. SCA goes through your code. There are variants for that in both binary analysis to look at, again, supply chain and built-in binaries, or source analysis that will find these things. And it's amazing. You know, we, we run these tools. You can go to a customer, and you find they use 20 different instances with different versions of OpenSSL in the same application. Why? Because this application was built by 100 developers, and each one needed, oh, I need SSL. Let me just download this from somewhere. Um, and you know, five of them still have Heartbleed in them, even though it's four years old now. So um, this is good. Um, SCA is also, it, you know, it, this space started from licensing and compliance before it went to security, because another problem is that you get, you know, a lot of bad licensing in. But um, it's now building up to be a great security solution. It works well with CICD, and again, it's being pushed earlier on into the IDE, into incremental testing, into um, ease of use. I think the biggest challenge that we have today, and that's true for all vendors in the space, we all have the same challenge, is we can tell you that your code has a vulnerable piece of, of library. We can't yet tell you whether you actually run this code or not. And so you have to fix it regardless of whether you really have to fix it or not. And it's a challenge, and I think, um, I hope that we're able to get some uh, progress on this now that we can combine a static analyzer and, and SCA. One more buzzword before I move on to getting it all to work together. MAST, mobile application security testing. So this has been very confusing, right? Because Gardner said there was SAS, there was DAST, and there was AST, and there was MAST. And it sounds like it's just another way to test code, but it really isn't. So MAST, which is mobile application security testing, is how do we test mobile applications? And in fact, it's a combination of all of the previous ones, plus something called uh, behavior analysis, which uh, are applied towards mobile applications. So I'm not going to talk specifically about MAST, because it's just more of the same, right? But if you've heard the buzzword, it's, it's great. OK. So how do we make it all work, now that we understand what works and what doesn't work? And I want to go through a few key principles that I really hope that they were mentioned yesterday already more than once, but I'll repeat them anyway. Um, and the first one is very important. If you can't beat them, join them. I have never, ever, ever seen a successful security implementation in CACD where all this is driven by security. Security can't do security. I know it's, it's weird, but security can only guide the development of how to do security, right? Uh, it's like QA can't do quality. They can just help the developers build quality code, right? So we have to enable the developers. And I'm not going to repeat that because everybody mentioned this a million times. Um, automation, automation, automation. Otherwise, uh, we end up like this nice lady uh, building things very, very slowly. Um, we cannot rely on any manual process. So I went to this customer maybe two years ago, and they said, we really figured out how to use, again, won't mention the name, one of the largest static analysis vendors in our CI pipeline. So every night we do a build, and we run that tool, and we can use the results in the morning said, but what about all the false positive? So in the morning, we have a team of six security people that come in and go through all of the results and push them to the bug tracking system if they think they're relevant. Oh, no, that's not a great solution. And then, you know, two weeks later, I sit with this guy for lunch, and we're talking of you know, just a friendly conversation. I said, well, we're becoming a real bottleneck in the process. Seriously? That's surprising. <laughs> So everything has to be automated. If you have a manual process somewhere in the way, kill it. Find a way. Write code. Script it or get rid of it. Or move it to the side. Shift left, I think we all understand that um, as early as possible. As I said, get 
testing done on the IDE, get everything fixed as well. Um, multiple technologies, flavors, and times. So a lot of smaller vendors, I, you know, we're, all, we're all guilty of this crime, want to tell you that you have the gold solution. You know, just put this and your problems go away. I wish that was true, because if it was, I would be much richer now. Um, but the reality is there is no one solution that solves everything. So you've seen all the solutions I mentioned with their little um, uh, flavors and everything, and they're still not enough. So everything you do, you're going to need a mix. What is the mix? Depending on how you build software, on what type of technologies you use, what speed you want to go at, but you're going to need to find the right mix. Now, this is really important. Parallel tracks in parallel speeds. There is all these nice new technologies that do everything really quickly, right? Like the IDE-based SAS and the inline IS. They have their limitations, right? It's maybe coverage or depth of analysis. There is a reason why the full analysis takes four hours and the lightweight analysis takes five seconds. It's not that somebody cracked the solution. It's that they're making compromises. So you need to work in parallel tracks. What does that mean? You need to figure out what can work fast enough for the speed that you're having that you can put it as a gate, right? As something that happens in real time in your CICD. And then you need to figure out what you take out, think of like a train, right? You take it to a slower track, and you can do that maybe once every week or once every month or whenever you feel like that looks it deeper and then pushes things to the backlog, right? Because we, we still want to fix everything, but maybe not right now. So this is super important, and you need to figure out your tracks. And I mentioned that, but you really have to accept the risk. You know the saying, don't get into the kitchen if you can't stand the heat. Um, if you don't want to accept risk, you're in the wrong business. Security is all about risk management. <coughs> so how to make it work? So what we see um, as we look at the faster and faster customers is that the only things that really work well in the critical path, right, as part of what's happening in real time in the CACD pipeline is um, instant or passive or things that are just there, right? That happen in the background while you code or test your application. And that's mostly the NID spell checker type or incremental if it's very, very, very fast, where your developers write code, they don't open another software, they just write code and they get findings on their code. And the findings have to be limited to the relevant stuff. It's tuned to show only the real things. You want to look at all the you know, hundreds of things, you can do that in the slower path. But this has to be very focused and in the ID. And you, if you've never wrote, written real code, you don't understand how significant that is. If you write something and now you get a warning, you fix it in one second, right? If you get the same data tomorrow, it's already going to be like 15 minutes, right? If you get it in a week, it's going to be half a day because you don't know what you wrote anymore. Um, so, and the other part is the inline IS, the thing that you put in your integration servers where they go into testing and the A-B testing and just sees whatever is happening as code is being executed by your test automation. And these can feedback so quickly that they can be part of your critical path. All the rest, and I'll get to the diagram in a second, uh, all the rest are, uh, are for the slower tracks because they're slower. That's the reality. Um, of course, if you have just a CI pipeline that's once a night, then you can use a lot of the other things in the critical path, and that's fine too. Um, the other thing is you need to define practical, and I go back to risk here, practical policies for what we call hard gates and soft gates, right? So hard gate is, I don't let this go forward, right? Meaning uh, SQL injection on my login screen. Okay, that's a blocker. Uh, you need to minimize as much as you can, and that goes back to risk appetite, what you put in the hot box. 
Really, just the really hardcore stuff. Because if you keep blocking the R&D, they're going to throw you out. And if we don't work with them right, we're done. Um, soft gate is all the rest. Soft gate means I saw this, I put a process in motion to remediate that. What does that mean? It could be that it goes into the backlog with a certain time limit. It means that there's a review process. Right? Like Zane said, let's have a discussion about this. So you need to have these things, you need to have these controls, but they shouldn't block the CICD pipeline. We really want to enable the velocity and not slow it down. So if I go back <coughs> to this crazy diagram, okay. um, we have, as I said, IDE, incremental if it's fast, inline IAST in these phases that are part of the fast pipeline. And then as we go to the full deployment, I create a separate track where I can do a SAST, a managed SAST if I prefer. It takes days, but I don't care. It's, it's on a slower track, right? Um, I can run a full DAST in the end. I had a customer that had SAST, two, two SAST. They bought our IS and a DAST and said, why do you need so many? He said, well, the DAST is just there to check our production site. If it finds something, I get fired. Right? Because it, we are not supposed to have anything at this point. Um, but this is, you know, and this is a suggestion, of course. It's not one truth. But this helps you understand how to put it in there. Um, so I talked about that. Rely heavily on integrated technologies, practical blocking criteria, and push all the rest to the backlog. Now, last thing before I'm done, A-B testing. I mentioned this in the beginning, and I'm coming back to it in the end, because I think this is going to be the biggest shift in security testing in the coming years, or at least dynamic security testing. Testing environments are going away. A-B testing is the new king, and you have to be part of it. Don't fight it. Don't say, oh, no, but we have to get at least a small test done. In the no, no, A-B testing. And don't worry, because if you build your A-B testing right, then you won't have a problem because this 1% is not exposed to the internet. It's exposed to a closed set of users. It's behind the load balancer that only directs specific users to there. And while they're testing it for functionality, you can test security on the same environment. Don't worry about it. Just make sure you use the right tool that doesn't disturb the users while they're working on it. Be part of the A-B testing revolution because it will make your job better. So. Software security testing is not simple. I think we all agree about that. Um, there's no one solution, but we can make it work, and we can make it work really great in CICD, and we can fix things really fast in CICD, which is the upside of that, as they mentioned. So work with your R&D and get it done. And finally, this I took on my first day here. Uh, so if you haven't been to Marina Bay Gardens, go there. Thank you. <laughs> questions? No questions. All clear? <laughs> Just, oh, wait. There's a question. Hello. So, uh, in terms of uh, A B testing, right? Uh, like you said, uh, you. Uh, release 1% traffic, 5% traffic. So uh, what do you think is the best way of, uh, uh, of building something that can, uh, that can route that uh, traffic, you know, based on those parameters, like whether you want to do internal customer testing or percentage-based testing? So I'll start with the, with the answer that I wouldn't let security be the guide to how to build the A-B testing. You should leave this to the DevOps team. Uh, but generally speaking, and this is what I've seen most of, of uh, organizations that go there do, you would want to get an initial very small subset of uh, people that are internal people, right? your QA team or whatever uh, that wants to work on it. Um, and you put it, again, most of what customers will have, they'll have a central server that takes in the traffic, usually it's an SSL terminator as well, and it will route you to an authentication server, and then based on your user, whether it's IP or your credentials that you use, it will route you 
to a set of servers that now have this new version, right? And you'll get first just your internal employees, and then the next group, which is still very restricted, is a group of customers that you have a good relationship with and agreed to be part of your beta testing for a discount or whatever uh, game you play with them. And they run it for another I don't know, minutes or hours, depending how big the change is and so on. And at this point, the servers that serve this are restricted, right? Because only these users, where, however you identified them, can go there. And right. it's a great time to do security testing, right? right? And then later, as you start expanding it, obviously there, you start introducing risk, right? Because if you say, I randomly push it to 10% of the customers, if yeah. a hacker is one of these 10%, then he can start hacking that. But ideally, you've already done some testing in the earlier phases. Sure. So from implementation point of view, it would be uh, like a customized layer that, would you, that you would be building that would be doing kind of a smart routing in place, yeah. right? Like having these additional parameters. Yes. Sure. OK, we're out of time. If you have more questions, you're more than welcome to talk to me outside. Thank you very much for coming. Oh. Thank you for inviting me.